So uh, welcome everyone. My name is Neeraj Kumar. I'm a solutions architect at Amazon Web Services. So uh, my goal with this session is to give you, uh, well, to start with a bit of an overview of what IoT and AI services, in particular, we will be talking about machine learning, uh, what these services are. It, it will be quite a technical session, so I will go uh, and show you some of the code as well in terms of how we can typically write code on the devices and for prototyping. Uh, to test IoT and, and some of the visualization I'll show. Uh, in fact, that's the next slide. This is what we'll see in the demo. Um, now, I won't be running the code in, on the exact device. I have some devices I wanted to share in terms of what we typically use for prototyping. You know, things like Raspberry Pi or Intel Edison uh, are typically uh, good for trying out codes like these. But really, the, the real focus will be on looking at IoT service. This is a service which allows us to uh, ingest data from the devices as well as um, uh, in, you know, pushing all this data into big data and analytic services and also control the devices. So it's kind of a bi-directional control that uh, IoT provides us for uh, getting the data and controlling the device. We're gonna use uh, DynamoDB just to ingest all this data, collect all this data, and we'll have two use cases I wanna demonstrate. One is once all this data is coming out from the devices, how can we you know, very easily and simply uh, visualize that, so I'm gonna use a service called Elasticsearch. It comes with inbuilt uh, dashboards called Kibana dashboards, so very simple to set up uh, you know, those, those sort of visualization. I'm also gonna show you uh, in terms of the voice interaction with Alexa. So uh, again, this is about really sparking a few thoughts and looking at the art of the possible, how we can control these devices through voice. Because voice is now becoming kind of the third, third dimension to how we communicate with the machines moving from the web interfaces to mobile interface. Now we are really moving into an era of artificial intelligence driven voice recognition and voice control. So we're gonna have a bit of a demo of Alexa as well. Um, two specific Alexa skills I've created. One where we'll just simply ask for the data. You know, uh, for example, just tell me what, what, what where's the, my drone flying. We're gonna simulate a drone here. So the script that I'm gonna run, we're gonna assume it's on some sort of drone which is used for either surveillance uh, for security purposes or, or either to monitor some you know, pipeline or some manufacturing plant. So we're gonna have some, uh, some um, sort of use case of that sort here as well. And also one of the key services here we're gonna use is Amazon Machine Learning. Now Amazon Machine Learning is it's a managed service, so is uh, AWS IoT, and we'll see how simple it is to build uh, models and, and create predictions based on, uh, you know, before that we have to train the model to know what the data pattern looks like. And then we, in the real time, we'll ask machine learning for uh, predictions. Is this likely to fail? Or it could be anything. I'll go into more detail what sort of uh, predictions, what sort of algorithms uh, machine learning offers. I'm gonna use one of them here for the, for the purpose of this demo. So before I go into the demo itself, I thought, just to go through a few slides, a quick primer on IoT and machine learning um, so that you know, we, we can ensure everyone is on, on the same page. Just a quick show of hands, how many people actually know what IoT is and you, know, you, you may have, okay, so half, half the audience. Let, so let, let me explain, let me go back to the basics in terms of what IoT is and why is it becoming so important now? So I, I think the Probably the simplest way of describing uh, Internet of Things is really about connecting your, the physical world with the digital world. Think of all the, the devices, the sensors out there. It could be, uh, you know, smart homes is one of the examples where you can see how I can today control the thermostat or even a light bulb remotely without even being at home. Or think of uh, other use cases such as health services where you can have devices attached to the patients which give you a real-time insight into what's going on with the health. And you can make some real-time judgment. And when you add machine learning on, on top of that, you can make some predictive uh, decisions as well. Is this a likelihood to go something wrong? Or what's the next thing that could happen? So those are the kind of use cases we can build with IoT and combined with AI services like machine learning. So really it's about making those physical devices which are all already out there in the network or, or in the you know, physical world and making them intelligent by two ways. One, where we can deploy some uh, sensors and some intelligence locally in the device. And then secondly, where cloud is playing a big role is ingesting all this data into the cloud for, for processing, for analyzing, and really understand what's the state of the physical world. It could be a sensor that's 
giving you uh, um, a telemetry information like what's the temperature, humidity, pressure, et cetera, on a, in a manufacturing plant, or, or something that we're going to pretend we have a, a drone where we're going to collect all this data. Um, so it, it makes, uh, it makes uh, those use cases really interesting because not only we can know in the real time, but we can make some predictive uh, decisions on that. And, and these are just some of the examples. They, they are many more, uh, like automotive. We are already seeing connected automobiles coming up where they can give you, um, now we've had sensors for many years in the modern cars, but now these sensors can give you a historical view of how your car or the component into your car has been operating. You can use it for real time fee uh, information feedback to the driver based on what these sensors are telling us on the car. So again, a lot of, lot of examples, a lot of use cases. Now, where does AWS IoT come into this then? So AWS uh, IoT is a platform that enables you to connect devices to AWS services in a secured way. You can connect one device or you can connect millions and billions of devices. Because it's a managed platform, it really takes the, uh, the, the, the pain away from managing the underlying infrastructure and it will scale up and scale down based on how your device, devices or sensors are growing. Uh, and like most of the services, managed services, you know, it manages the availability, scalability, and more importantly, security, which is very important in, in uh, IoT context as well as generally in, in the uh, IT concept, context. So security is also kind of at the core of um, the platform. This is just a very high level overview of how the IoT platform works. Um, and uh, let me just very quickly walk through some of the key components here. We talked about security. So at the heart of it is about authentication. It's a mutual authentication. So device knows it's connecting to the right uh, IoT uh, broker or IoT platform. And likewise, IoT platform knows this is the device that I recognize. Uh, what happens is when you register a device or when you create a device on AWS IoT platform, you have a choice to either generate the certificates and then take them and deploy on your device, or you can bring your own certificates as well. So you have a num number of uh, different options to do that. The device gateway is, a, is, again, it's the core part of the IoT platform. This is where the communication happens between the device and, and the, the IoT server. It can speak over multiple prep protocols. One of the common ones used in uh, IoT uh, devices is MQTT, which is kind of a lightweight protocol, really designed for constrained devices, or it can support HTTP or in web sockets. So this manages all the communication between the device and the backend IoT server. Then we have something called registry. This is where you can go and look up for your devices. You can have some metadata defined for your devices. What's the last firmware it's working on? What was the, you know, or, or you can have the category of these devices. Is it a thermostat versus some other sensor? So you can maintain some metadata about these devices. Shadow is, again, a very important concept in AWS IoT platform. This is how you communicate back to device. So when you, when you need to communicate back to a device or you have mobile application or any other application, uh, let's think of a smart home scenario where you want to control your heating. How do you communicate back to the device? How do you control the state of the device is through the shadow. So shadow is uh, a concept where device will report its current state. If let's say if it's an engine, it'll say I'm on. But from my application, I can go and change the shadow, that switch off. The next time when device pulls the shadow, it'll know my state request has been changed and it will take the action depending on whatever logic you have written on your device. So this is a way how you asynchronously communicate with the devices. And rules engine is where it makes really interesting because IoT, at this point, we've understood how you get the data from devices into IoT. Rule engines really help you to push this data into other AWS services for further analysis and creating dashboards or, or you know, analyzing that information. So here's just some examples. You can, uh, what you can do with the rules engine, you can invoke a Lambda function which is uh, even driven code. You can write a code and your own logic. You can uh, push this data into S3 bucket, which is again an object store, or you can insert this data into DynamoDB or, and many other services that you, you can see here, depending on your use case, how you're trying to use that information. So that's a quick primer on uh, IoT. Let me just very quickly go through machine learning and, and then we'll jump into the demo and see uh, something in action. So, we can capture this information, we can store, we can analyze, we can see historically the trend, what's going on, we can even do some real-time uh, metrics on, on top of that, real-time uh, analytics on top. But really now, we are, as I was saying earlier, we are now in, moving into a predictive world. With a lot of these devices, what if I could actually 
uh, query this data which I'm collecting and, and see uh, from the data patterns uh, what could, what's the likelihood of the next step. If it's, a, if it's a sensor deployed on a, a water pipeline, for example, is there a way for me to detect that maybe the leak could happen? Or, or in this drone example, I'm going to collect all this data and see, is there a chance that this drone can crash based on this telemetry information I'm, I'm getting? So machine learning really helps you build predictive analy analytics on the top of data that we've been collecting. So it's a technology that finds the patterns uh, in your data and helps you make a uh, uh, predictions on, on that basis. So really, when you combine your data with machine learning, is really what's enabling, going to enable smart applications. And essentially, smart applications is what we need for building smarter cities. You know, they, they, that's, that's what is gonna underpin. Uh, right from smart homes to smart offices to smart streets, where you can you know, apply a lot of these applications. And here's some few more examples. You can do things like fraud detection based on the transactions you have captured, based on the the history of, of the transactions, you know, particularly uh, uh, appropriate in uh, like identifying spam emails or identifying, uh, you know, looking at the order history where the fraud has happened in the past, and you can train your the machine learning model to detect those kind of patterns. Personalization uh, is another one, and uh, many others uh, like content classifying the content. You know, you, you can have an object and you can identify which sort of area does this object really fit in. You know. So there are, there are three sort of predictions you can do today with machine learning. As I said, this is a um, machine, le Amazon machine learning is a managed platform. You really don't need to know all the intricacies of data science. You can, being a developer, like I'm not a data scientist and I'll show you how easy it is to set up your models, ingest your data, and it will do all the, uh, you know, run the evaluations for you. And um, all you do is through API calls, you, you, you make predictions. So today it supports three, broadly speaking, three kind of algorithms. You can do binary classification. This is where you give, you provide a data set and you say, here's my target value. In, in this case, I'm gonna use an uh, example of drones where, where I have a lot of different telemetry information and I'm just asking it to tell me, is this likely to fail or not, zero or one. That's, that's what the binary prediction is gonna uh, uh, tell me. Multi-class classification is where you're trying to, where you have data and you're trying to fit that data into uh, some of the class. I mean. Think of a movie, a movie recommendation where you have a new information about a movie and you're trying to predict, well, which kind of genre does it fit in? So based on the previous data, it can give you that prediction as well. Regression is where uh, you're predict, trying to predict the next value. So if I give you a quick example, like in, in sales, what's the likelihood of sales of product X over the next quarter or next month based on the historic data that I hold about the sales? So regression is really trying to guess the next value in, in that data set. So broadly, these are the three uh, algorithms today with machine learning. The one I'm gonna show you is going to use binary classification. So very quickly, how do we go about creating this? And I'll, I'll show you this on the console as well. We, first, we need to have a good data. Now, machine learning algorithm will be only as good as the data we are providing. It's a supervised learning. We need to have really good data set and, and good, good history behind that data set so machine learning algorithm can pick those trends easily. So that's one thing. And then we go about training the model. We're gonna evaluate, we can optimize. And once we are happy, we, we can start using it using either batch predictions where we can make a call and we have, let's say, a lot of predictions to make. We can do it in a batch for, uh, uh, sort of way or in the application I'm gonna show you, you can also use it in a real time. So with each payload, which my device is gonna generate, I'm gonna check for each payload, uh, what, what's the likelihood of you know, this drone crashing, for example. So back to the demo. Uh, let's, let's get started then. I just wondered how to end this presentation. So the first thing I want to show you is um, a little code here. So uh, this is a simple Python script. Um, I have, in this case, I've already registered my device, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm using, I'm specifying where my certification, my certificate, and my private keys are. And the real bit is happening in this code, where, where I'm just going to loop through. I'm going to randomly generate. Um, some of these uh, data points like you know, uh, the drone ID I'm imagining here, I have five drones, I'm gonna randomly generate a number between one and five, altitude, speed, temperature. 
if, if I was to do it in the real world, I'll actually collect this data from the census. You know, so it's the similar concept. In this case, because I'm running it on my laptop, I'm, I'm generating this data randomly. Um, I, I create a payload, it's a JSON object. So first thing I'm doing here is, first of all, I'm calling my machine learning uh, API. I'm sending all this data to machine learning, and I'm checking if the prediction is one. In this case, it'll be zero or one. One is where it's met that criteria, what I, what I had originally trained my model for. Then I'm gonna just stop the script. So machine learning is telling me, yes, I think this is a likelihood that you know what you've trained me, that's true, uh, and I'm gonna stop this script. And at the same time, using this statement here, uh, MQTT client to publish, I'm sending this data to IoT broker as well, and I'll show you what happens behind the scene when this, uh, this program is gonna send all this data to IoT. So let's just quickly run this. So what's happening behind the scene? Is it visible at the back, or do you want me to make the font size a little bigger? Yeah? Okay. Sorry? Okay, let me try and make it a little bit. So what's happening here is, as you saw in the code, it's just sending this payload, and look, what happened here? Um, it identified the value one, and it just simply came out of the program because it thought, you know, this doesn't look good. Machine learning is telling me there's something wrong. Now, in this case, because, uh, you know, I, I had crafted the data in such a way so I can show you, you know, how machine learning will predict. This may not necessarily be the, the case when you're running this in real, uh, but here I'm playing a lot around with the random values that I'm creating. So what's happening behind the scene is, if I go to my AWS console, so first of all, on the dashboard, I can see uh, you know, the state of, uh, of my IT broker, so I can see how many connections being made, what sort of messages are being pushed, how many messages have been published, what rules have been executed. So let me just very quickly walk through this uh, IoT console first, firstly. So here you'll see the registry. Here's the thing, I'm calling it my Intel Edison because usually I, uh, I run the same script on my Intel Edison, which is one of the devices like Raspberry Pi. And within this, I can see there's a unique identifier here. I can see the shadow, uh, and I can see the security uh, in terms of the certificates which are generated for this device. And also, there's a rule I have created here. So what's happening is when from that Python script, it's all going into IoT, using this rule, I'm invoking a Lambda function, and I'm just passing, using a simple select statement, now, this is where I can do filtering of data. For example, if I do not want to send everything for the backend system to process, I can filter the data coming from device here using the rules engine in IoT. I can say select star from drone is the name of the topic here where I'm publishing where temperature is greater than 25, whatever. You know, so I can filter, I can create conditions where only I'm interested to send this data to, to my database or, or the backend visualization engine. So rule engine gives you all, all, all those uh, capabilities. Then I can add more actions. As I said on the PowerPoint, I can link it to many other services. I, I can push it into another IoT topic. I can send it to uh, you know, CloudWatch for monitoring and so on and so forth. Okay, so because I'm triggering this Lambda function, this is again a simple Python script. So as the payload arrives from the from the program, from the device, I'm taking that, I'm, I'm putting it, updating my um, DynamoDB table. If we go and query our DynamoDB table, we can see all this data is coming across here in the, in the back end. Now this is fine, but let's create some good visualization of this data. So as I showed on the chart, I am also at the same time from Lambda pushing this data into what is called Elasticsearch. This is where I can query and search and, and create nice visualization on top. And if I can make it somehow bigger, okay. So this is where uh, that chart is. So it's a, it's a Kibana, it's part of the Elasticsearch service. So I'm from that information uh, displaying what's the average temperature, I'm looking at the altitude, the speed it's reporting, 
and some nice chart around the speed, humidity, pressure, and also breaking this down by, because I said in the code, I'm generating five different drones, so just to simulate that there are five drones flying at the same time, I can look uh, the sort of average temperature reported by each of these. So this is again a very simple example of how you can you know, quickly, you don't need to do any programming for this. Once the data in Elasticsearch, you can create, you can query the data, you can define the, you know, uh, your x-axis, y-axis for each of these charts, and you can bring all these charts together into this uh, high-level dashboard which I'm displaying here. Okay, so we, we've seen how we can push this data through IoT into DynamoDB, we can, we can do some uh, uh, nice visualization. Uh, also, very quickly, let me show you the machine learning uh, model here. So on the console itself, it'll walk you through the three steps that you go through. So first step is you need to either upload your data. You, it could be in sitting in S3 and you can point it from there. The step two is then you create and train your model. So once you uh, upload your data, you say, okay, train, and it'll go for back in the background for a few minutes, depending on the data size as well. Uh, it will train your model and it'll be ready for predictions. So let me just show you the one I have already here. So if I show you the data source, in fact, data source, let me show you the data I used to train. Um, oops. Is this simple data around, I think, 1,000 records I have. I had j literally just generated this myself uh, just to train my machine learning algorithm. So uh, I'm, these are all the random del values I generated in the past. So what's the altitude, drone ID, et cetera, et cetera. And also, this is where this uh, sort of supervised learning is. This is the value I'm going to expect my machine learning model to generate. Tell me it's crash condition or not. And the way I'm training is, when I've got one, machine learning will say, okay, if the condition, if the pattern is this, it's likely to fail. And I've got, I think, roughly 20 or 30 records of this whole entire table where I have given the conditions to fail. So when I put this data, machine learning try to digest the data, sees where uh, the prediction is one, and literally, when I send it a new set of parameters, new set of uh, uh, telemetry data, it's going to look against the patterns it's uh, derived from this data to say whether it should be zero and one. So this is the column which it's going to predict, essentially, with a new set of data. But if the inputs are random, then how can it find a prediction? Uh, in this case, I had made sure the temperature, humidity, and pressure are in a certain combination is above certain threshold. Yes. It's just all handcrafted, yes. But just to demonstrate the purpose of how you can... Um, uh, how, how you can use the model. Yeah. How do you continue to train it to just keep putting on more values? Like exactly. That? So the more data it is, the, the better it gets with prediction. Uh, so, yeah. So the more, more patterns it can recognize, uh, that, that, yeah, that's the, uh, the, the fundamental principle of machine learning, the more data we give. And also not just more data, good quality data. Because if, it's, if there's a lot of randomness in that data, it won't really know. Because w one other thing it does, if I go back to my console, it gives me a score, it also gives me a score. So it's telling me, yes, it's likely to be true, but how confident it is. So this is, again, one of the principles of machine learning, how confident it is about, so I can predict, I can code that, okay, not only I'm looking for whether it's a true or false, but what's the confidence score my machine learning algorithm is giving me, and then base my next decision on, on, on that. So if I quickly go, so yeah, this is where I've defined my data source, drone telemetry. Uh, I can, yeah, if I want to retrain, I'll just go and create this again, or I can evaluate my model. Um, this is the file on S3. It's the same file which I showed you, which it's using, it's showing the total number of records, et cetera. But if we go and, um, you can do some uh, quality uh, check with your data. It's showing me out of these total records, 37 is where it has identified while training the model where the, uh, the, the prediction was true. And then if we quickly jump to the model itself. So this way it will give me a, a brief uh, overview of the model, what data cells it used. And uh, if I go and try and evaluate this, um, or let's just use the existing evaluation because it may take some time. I can look at the performance of my model. With performance, it shows you, uh, using this slider, the, with machine learning, because it gives you, uh, 
obviously, it's, it's, uh, looks like a perfect model, 100% correct. It won't be in the, in the true data set. You'll always have some error. So let me show you something which is more realistic. In fact, I've got a sample data here, and this is where a typical model will look like. If I go and explore this, this is what a typical data set will look like. Here it's giving you, well, after training, what's the level of correctness, you know, after it evaluated the model, and what are the rate of errors? So what you, uh, by default, what it does is when I provide, let's say, uh, data with 1,000 records, it's going to use 70%, like 700 records for uh, training and 30% for testing the model, like how well it has learned. And that's what it's telling me here. Based on its learning, what's the error rate in there? Now, the interesting thing with the false negative and false positive, you can control this. So, for example, if you have, based on your business case, if you can tolerate, uh, maybe you can't tolerate any false negative. Maybe there's a cost associated with if I get a false reading. So I can accept maybe false positive, but not false negative if there's a heavy cost involved with that, and vice versa. So I can actually fine tune my model towards you know, where the weighting should go, false positive or false negative. So, here's, so this is again where, which helps you sort of fine tune. And once I've done that, I can query this in the real time. This is where I can test my model on the console. I'm, in my case, I'm just sending a code. Um, so let's see if, uh, oh, okay, it's a different data set. Anyway, so going back to the code again, this is what I'm sending for real time predictive, uh, uh, prediction. I'm just sending all this data to my machine learning URL. This is where the, the service is, and sending the school back. So finally, the last bit of thing I want to do was uh, show you the voice interaction. And hopefully it can, it's connected to the internet. So if I go back to my design again. So what we are going to do here is we're going to do a couple of things. I'm going to use Alexa to firstly find out what's the current state of the drone. And in the code, what, what I've done is, uh, it's again a simple Lambda function, uh, a Node.js function, which is going to query DynamoDB and tell me what those altitudes or whatever those coordinates are. So let's just try this. Hopefully it's connected to the internet here. <laughs> Alexa, ask drone to report its current location. flying over the pipeline in zone A at an altitude of 532 meters. Its current speed is 10 kilometers per hour. Right, so very simple skill. What's happening behind the scene? Uh, in Alexa developer portal, I've linked my Lambda function. Oh, I need to mute this because every time I say Alexa, it's gonna <laughs> say something. I can't find it, Bob, but <laughs> All right. your music library. I've muted it, <laughs> sorry about that. So what's happening behind the scenes? Simple, uh, simple function. You can see the script here that I'm playing. But in the script, I'm uh, injecting my actual variables. It's looking at the past 60 records and giving me an average of altitude, speed, et cetera, in, in the speech. Now, when I started talking about IoT, I said it's not just one way. It's not just about injecting data into IoT. I can control my device back as well. So let's see how we can use Alexa to control the device. So let's fire off the... Uh, drone engines, so to say, um, and um, now in this case, what I'll do is, um, rather than machine learning, let's say I'm visually monitoring the drone telemetry and I find I, I identify something not right in, a, in my command and control room, and I, through voice, I want to make this drone emergency land wherever it is because I've sensed something is not right. So, I'm gonna fire up the script again. Let's just kick off and... Alexa, ask drone controller for emergency landing. Okay, I'm now initiating the emergency drone landing process. The drone will land at its closest landing zone in approximately five minutes. Okay. So uh, let me try this once more. I, think, I hope there's no Wi-Fi issue. Alexa, ask drone controller for emergency landing. Right. Okay, I'm now so, initiating the emergency drone landing process. 
so what happened behind the scene is, again, using the concept of shadows, this Alexa skill, if I'd show you the code behind under the hood, in this drone controller, I'm actually updating the shadow, and this is where I'm saying, so this is where I'm updating the shadow of this IoT device to say off, and back in the code which is running on my device, uh, where's that? Sorry, wrong code, yeah. So back on the device, further up, I'm checking if the, if the state reported, so I'm continuously polling the shadow, if the shadow reported is off, is going to display this message, which you show when the you know I, I try to control the state using Alexa. So, so that's that's how, roughly what I wanted to cover in this session. Um, hopefully, give you a bit of a perspective of how we can utilize AI and you know uh, Alexa, you know, particular machine learning. Uh, very briefly, I wanted to talk to you. I, I don't have a demo, but I just wanted to wrap up on the artificial intelligence side of things. I wanted to cover one other service very briefly because again. It potentially plays a big role when we when we are talking about you know smarter cities uh, and smart applications. Uh, you'll probably uh, see the relevance of that, which is uh, if I can call Amazon recognition. It's a fairly new service. We launched it back in uh, I think a couple of months ago in the last reInvent. Uh, again, Amazon recognition is, is like machine learning. It's a fully managed service. It applies deep learning uh, algorithm. It's, it's uh, for image recognition. So these are just four type of, broadly speaking, use cases that we can use uh, recognition for. It could be about uh, analyzing an object or a scene. You know, so it could be, in this case, it could be a man on, on a bike. It will give me labels on, on that image. So what's going on in that scene? So it, it, can, it can show you things like there's a car, there's a tree, there's a, there's a person, there's a bus. It can do some object and scenery analysis. The other use case is uh, around facial analysis. So you know, something you can use for demographic or, or you know, just to know the state of, uh, of, of people going in the, sorry. You had a what's the difference between deep learning and the learning for the drone? Sorry, what's the difference between the learning, deep learning and the learning used by the drone? So the learning I showed you, that's, a, that's a Amazon machine learning. And in this case, recognition is purely for image recognition. Uh, it's, it's two different use cases. There, yeah. Can I uh, use an arbitrary image? So let's say the AWS logo, and then put a bunch of images through to have it look for that logo, uh, rather than using faces and objects. Uh, for objects, uh, not at the moment today. Um, so today, when you, uh, let's say you, you make an API call, you can say, okay, try and analyze this image. Uh, you, it's not quite like similar to machine learning where you can train with a sample data set. It's really based on the current catalog of images which are there in the system. Well, so, which you predefine. Yes. In case of faces, though, you can have uh, one of the uh, uh, you know, last two, like face comparison, face recognition. Let's say you have a face of, uh, let's think of a security scenario where you know faces of all your employee stored in S3. You can make an API call. When you get a new image, you can compare against your catalog of images to say, is this person recognized or not? So I think the potential security uh, use cases could be if you're trying to identify an unauthorized person in a secured premises, for example. It could be office. It could be a plant or manufacturing uh, facility. So it's pretty good for uh, those kind of use cases. Um, yeah, again, if you think of uh, from a smart city perspective, we have you know, CCTVs, connected CCTVs, giving you, you know, uh, kind of in the real time analyzing either people are on, in, in the crowd, you're looking for maybe some specific profile. You know, there, there, there can be potentially a lot of good security use cases for services like these. Or it could be face-based face authentication. You, know, you, can, you can walk into an office and, and you, you're recognized by your face and, and you know, the door opens for you, that sort of thing. So, so it's a fairly new service. I think we are still, uh, you know, uh, we're still seeing how customers are using these services. And uh, like with any other service, you know, it will mature over a period of time. We will add more functionality. So uh, just some examples, how you can use APIs for detecting labels. So, so in this case, again, like, like with machine learning, when it gives you a, um, 
a label, it'll give you confidence as well, how confident it is that it is actually a boat in, in the picture, for example. Or, or the same thing with detecting faces. Uh, it, will, it, it can give you, uh, well, what, you know, who is in the picture? Is it male or female? Are they smiling or not? Are they wearing glasses or not? So it can really do a really good facial analysis and at the same time give you, um, you know, a sort of confidence score. And same thing as we're talking about comparing faces. And there's some potential use cases where applications these like these can be used. So uh, I think I've covered everything I wanted to cover from a security perspective. Um, I know we are probably very close to the lunch time. I'm happy to take any questions you may have now or I'm around lunch time. You know, please come and talk to me. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about the tech solution and if it happens in real time and uh, block the transfers uh, or does that come later? So uh, I'm interested in the tech solution. Also, uh, how does the end, end user uh, see the solution? How do, they, how, how do they use it? So you, your question is whether or not you can use this in real time. Let's say if you built a fraud detection. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Or if it, if, or if it likes banks or... You get a lot later, or you, yeah, well, like email, months later, so. Sure, so uh, as, as I showed earlier, there are two ways you can use Amazon machine learning. Either you can use it in a uh, batch prediction, or you can use them in a real-time prediction. In fact, what, what I showed you in the demo was where in the real-time I'm making a call with every single payload to check whether or not this is a, a zero or one. In this case, it's a binary uh, prediction. Uh, so yeah, absolutely, it can be used, again, depending on how you're developing your application. So let's say if you've created a machine learning uh, model for detecting fraud, uh, and you have trained your model, you're happy with the, you know, the, uh, when you've evaluated your model, you're happy with the, the outcome from that model, then you can straight away, it's, it's again, like most other services, or, or all services which are exposed through uh, REST APIs, you can make API calls from your application, maybe running in the background, making that real time, uh, check on whether this is likely to be a fraud or not. So it uh, depends on how mature your model is, how confident you are with your model res results. Yeah, absolutely. So, how did how did end user know? How does end user? Yeah. How did I get out? How did end user get the log? For instance. So it could be uh, now again we are going into the uh, application design and application uh, how you define define application like that. If, if, you, if you have machine learning algorithm, you can write, say you have a backend web application, which is doing the rest of the other things like inter interfacing with the user or you know, whatever that application is. But in the, in the code, you can make that a, a, a machine learning calls. And if, they, if let's say you have detected a, a problem or machine learning is saying there's, there's likelihood is, you know, th there's a fraud, you can, you can have instant notification to the user. So it'll all come down to how you design that application. But from machine learning perspective, yeah, you can you can integrate with uh, you know in, in a real time with any application really. It could be web application, it could be mobile application, it can diff different form of applications. Yeah, but yeah, real time is a perfectly valid use case for machine learning. Mm -hmm. I noticed this box says "Do not throw at anyone's head." So yeah, <laughs> there was a, that diagram with all the different boxes and Amazon services. There's a lot of arrows. Do you know if all that stuff can be set up via the Amazon CLI, or you have to go into the console to, to link all these AMP Lambda yeah, functions? Absolutely. So like all Amazon Web Services uh, services that we have, you can, I, I showed on the console because it's easier to see in, in a demo like this, but I can script the entire thing. I can use SDKs if, I, if I'm using Python or Node or Java, or I can use CLIs to create everything. You can create model, you can create prediction, evaluate everything through CLI, absolutely. Yeah, in the robot example, I think everything is, most of the things is controlled by rules. So rules, human need to understand. If the rules is not right, the machine learning will not do much. Is it right? The rules engine I showed on the IoT is uh, slightly different. Let, let me go back to, oh, okay, it's here. So rules engine within IoT is really as a, as a way to ingest this data further down. You know, so rules engine allows you to filter data. For example, in, in this example I showed, I'm, I'm sending, uh, you know, temperature, humidity, pressure, I can control with rules engine, I can control what data, which device is ingesting, I choose to put down in the further downstream service like, you know, a database or, or another 
uh, service like Kinesis. So I can control, it's almost like a, a, a control point where I can choose what data I want to ingest in my other services for analysis or visualization. So that's what Rule Engine is used for. Whereas machine learning, it was slightly different service from IoT. This is where I created the model with the, uh, with the, with the previous historic data. And I trained uh, the model by saying, it's, it's kind of a supervised learning where I know where for sure this drone was crashed in the past. I put one. So when, it was, when, when it's creating a model, it knows, yes, when, when it's a pattern that looks like this, when the temperature, humidity, pressure, or anything else like is, is of a certain combination, it's likely to be a failure. So it's, it's working uh, you know, separately from the rule engine within IoT. In one case, I don't have the previous data. Let's say I'm starting a new service and I don't have any previous data. So how can I train machine learning that, okay, something will happen? Yeah, that's, that's kind of, a, with machine learning data, crucial, crucially, so the, yeah. Any example you created, um, uh, yes, data. for the purpose of demo, yes. So, so in the real life, I also want to create a new service, and I don't have any previous data, but I want some prediction on that base. I think with, uh, you can always start with, as you start ingesting, let's say, new data, you, you can start training your model from that point. I mean, there's nothing, it, it may not give you exactly the accurate result because of maybe there isn't enough data trained, but eventually, over a period of time, as you retrain your model, as you collect more and more data, it'll get more and more smarter about those predictions, as it'll see more patterns. So, that's how you can mature your model as you mature your data sets. So uh, yeah, but you will ne need at least some level of data so you can get some sense out of the machine learning algorithm because an algorithm is only good enough, as good as the data that you're injecting in, into the model. So that, that's definitely there. Or, or you can, in this case of demo, I just created this just for the sake of demo, but if you know historically, uh, what the what the fail points are? What are that prediction? If you if you have some idea about that, you can construct that data set to train that. You know, with, with some sort of sample data set. That that's another way. But uh, as long as it's accurate to the real world, I think uh, that's what you're really looking for.